Kate Sowers. Well. well, great. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It gives me really great pleasure to welcome you all back here again for the first lecture um, in quite a while, it seems. Mm -hmm. And even greater pleasure to introduce Melanie to you. Um, so I know Melanie mainly through my connections at Central St Martins, where she's an associate lecturer on the MA Furniture and Jewelry by Project Design course. Um, and also in her role as a board member of the Association for Contemporary Jewelry, which is another reason we're here today. Um, Melanie's career is widely varied, and you're going to hear a lot about her amazing work, but also the, the other ways that she's involved um, with, with the jewelry world. So from her from her experience going to Afghanistan to teach at Turquoise Mountain in association with the British, association with the British Council, um, and also more recently um, her work as a co-founder of the Jewelry Futures Fund. Um, so we are also incredibly lucky to have Melanie here. She's in an incredibly <laughs> busy time in her life right now, um, having in the last couple of months just jetted from Bermuda via New York to, from one show opening to another in London. So um, yeah, we're incredibly lucky to have Melanie here. Um, so yeah, without further ado, Melanie Eddy. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for having me and a big thank you to Anna for uh, encouraging me to do this talk. It's something we've talked about for some time and <laughs> finally kind of we're doing it. So um, just a bit of basic introduction to my, to my jewellery, which is the, the core of my practice. Um, so some of you might be familiar with my jewellery. Uh, if not, um, I'm known for my kind of sculptural geometric uh, jewellery, which is um, kind of abstract uh, in form. And I work across a number of materials, um, precious metals predominantly, um, both gem set and, um, and just sculptural pieces. So, um, and I'm going to also talk a little bit as well about, as uh, Anastasia mentioned, about the nature of my work um, beyond my uh, core, the core practice of my, of my jewelry career, which is making, designing and making at the bench, but also involves in other aspects of the jewelry sector. So um, I've, been, I've done jewelry sector development work um, globally, mostly in Southeast Asia. So in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, and, and India, um, and also work as an educator and also do writing and curating. So I'll touch a little bit on that, but I'll really focus more on the topic of, um, of, today's, uh, of today's lecture. Um, and so in addition to my involvement with the ACJ, which has been over nine years now as a member of the board and 17 years in going as a, as a member of the ACJ. Um, as Anastasia mentioned, I'm a founder of the Jewelry Futures Fund. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, I've been involved for a year since June with the Crafts Council Global Majority Steering Group. And there'll be more coming out about some of the initiatives the Crafts Council are doing around inclusion and diversity within the craft sector. Um, and I'm also involved in the Black and Jewelry Coalition, which is based out of the US, but it has an international membership, and the Pan-African Jewelers Association. So one of the reasons why I'm talking about the topic that I'm talking today is that within my formal education in jewelry, I often felt a keen lack of exemplars I could relate to, or that I felt as recognizable and relatable from my own cultural background, even within wider design education. This is not unusual, I think, for many of us, um, in particular some of us in this room, of a certain age or generation. Um, to some extent, we've kind of come to accept this experience within many areas of our lives. But in truth, I've come to feel passionately that it's important that students feel represented through the exemplars discussed with them. And not only them, but um, with, also with their peers from within dominant culture, within their places of learning. So I feel that all students should be supported in their learning by a true diversity of references and without hierarch hierarchical cultural bias. Um, so there's a greater shift within other fields of study um, than necessarily within education in design and particularly jewelry. And I'm hopeful we will catch up. So um, just a quick recap of some of the wider work that I won't really get time to discuss that much. Um, in this lecture, but there's some indications here of um, some of the writing I've been involved in, um, exhibition, curation, installation. Um, got Richard here from the V&A and I was involved in 
the Pearl Exhibition uh, back in 2013 and installing um, that exhibition alongside a team from conservation and curation. So as a disclaimer and a warning, um, and also, sorry, and also mentioned um, the teaching roles both within higher education and also more widely um, in programs that are available to um, the community, both within um, arts comm courses, like through um, courses like CSM that might run uh, short courses, but also um, through uh, short uh, kind of master courses and weekend engagement courses that are wide open to the wider uh, public. So this was a program I did through the National Gallery that was to do with um, looking at rendering and looking at um, learning to paint um, through a very traditional style of jewelry illustration, which is involves gouache and watercolors. So um, a, a disclaimer that as part of the context of this talk, I will be discussing in brief uh, the transatlantic slave trade and some artistic movements and traditions that may be triggering for some with lived experiences of racism stemming from colonial practices and its resultant ideologies. I have tried to limit this content to that which is relevant and contextual, but this is a notice that I will be addressing some of these truths as part of the topics discussed. If you need to excuse yourself or take a break from the proceedings of this talk at times, or if you are listening to a recording and you need to mute or avoid part of the proceeding, please do whatever is needed for your own personal well-being. Uh, the slide headings will cue the topics to be discussed. So um, I mentioned earlier about the Jewelry Futures Fund. Um, so the Jewelry Futures Fund is a charitable organization that's been established to address the lack of diversity in the jewelry industry and to facilitate change through education, advocacy, and community. And these are the other um, things I mentioned earlier, the Black and Jewelry Coalition, um, the Craft Council Steering Group, and uh, PAJA or Pan-African Jewelers Association. So I am from Bermuda. Um, so for those of you who are unaware, um, as a Bermudian, I am British uh, by birth, as all Bermudians are, are in Bermuda. Bermuda is self-governing British overseas territory. I'm also a dual national, as I also hold New Zealand citizenship through my father. Bermuda is very small, uh, 21 square miles. It is the little tiny dot here <laughs> in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so we have, it's, as I said, it's very small, both geographically, but also in terms of population. Um, we have a resident population of just under 64,000 people. So um, Bermuda is often ignored or given kind of perfunctory treatment in English colonial as well as American and Caribbean history. Um, though its own history is inextricably tied to that of all of these regions. Bermuda has played a role out in proportion to its diminutive size. So just to kind of clarify to some extent, Bermuda is technically not in the Caribbean, but also kind of yes. <laughs> so I'll explain. So um, even though technically it's not part of the Bermuda, part of Bermuda is not part of the Caribbean, Bermuda is very much actually a part of the Caribbean. So our trade links, our cultural links, our histories are intertwined, our populations are intertwined in that many of uh, Bermuda citizens um, have ancestry or links within the Caribbean and still have family um, in other islands of the Caribbean. So another thing which I'm sure people associate with Bermuda. <laughs> so yes, Bermuda, that is where the Bermuda Triangle is. Bermuda is the Eastern point of the notorious Bermuda Triangle. No, I won't be answering questions about this at the end of the talk, um, but we will for sure be covering triangles in this talk, but not this most famous one that's associated with Bermuda. So don't worry, this is not going to be Bermuda 101, but I'm going to give just give some of a few examples of how a teeny tiny country in the middle of Atlantic and her people have actually been part of some pretty big things. So first of all, Bermuda, um, Unlike many other islands in the Caribbean um, and off the southern eastern coast of the US was not based on a slave plantation economy model. Bermuda was and to some extent continues to have a maritime economy. 
Um, yes, we need to acknowledge that at times, almost all or much of the labor of the economic growth that stemmed from this economy relied on the labor of the enslaved. But Bermuda doesn't fit neatly into um, the often narrow definitions that are associated with transatlantic slavery. The distinctive characteristics that formed out of the trade and maritime activities of Bermudians set it apart from much of the British Atlantic world. So, um, by connecting Anglo-American regions with each other and the Caribbean, Bermuda not only coped with frequent imperial wars, rapid regional expansion, and market volatility and piracy, but also thrived by exploiting opportunities in the Atlantic to become a strategic intelligence center. How did this tiny island with little to offer besides potentially its position? Um, and that's even tenuous because Bermuda is surrounded by very treacherous reefs and the island's waters are littered with uh, shipwrecks <laughs> to prove it. So um, Bermuda has no commodities or tradable natural resources. So there were no pearls or other treasures that were discovered. Um, and this, what we think of as an island is actually in fact an archipelago of 181 islands. So it was not suitable for any type of mass agriculture. So enter the Bermuda Sloop and the Bermuda Rig, um, which is the design of the sails. So basically in short, the Bermuda Sloop and the Bermuda Ring, which was a single masted um, yacht or a ship, instigated a move from quadrilateral sails to triangular sails. Um, and this was the basis of all modern sailing yachts. So Bermuda's most wide reaching contribution to the nautical world was a very well-designed triangle, <laughs> a triangular sail to be exact. So Bermuda's shipping and shipbuilding industry integrated the new and the old world. It integrated British American shipping and commerce as a whole, and the island became an almost invisible central hub of intercolonial commerce and communication. So this may seem like a segue or a digression, um, but I will come back to this. Um, later because it is important for our context. So my background and my work in jewelry, both as a jeweler, um, but also my wider, wider work as an educator and within the jewelry sector um, are known to many of you in the audience and maybe you've also seen about it if you um, follow me or, or um, come to any of the other talks I've been involved in online. But less known is that my undergraduate was a BA in English and International Comparative Studies. So a lot of my focus of undergraduate study had a global and transnational focus and international and comparative studies programs focus on challenging dominant approaches. I had a particular focus on post-colonial literature, international development and indigenous studies. So coming to decolonization of the curriculum. Through my involvement as an educator within higher education, I am aware of research projects and initiatives within universities aimed at decolonizing the curriculum. Some of which I have been asked to engage with, but generally in response to outcomes and rarely with any agency. I am also aware of the speed at which this work is actually interpreted and integrated within course curriculums. There is a tendency for this work to become siloed. So whilst it is undertaken, it is not always applied and definitely not always easily accessible or transparent throughout the hierarchy of institutions. So what often happens within institutions in regards to diversity and inclusion policies, or indeed these decolonization activities in terms of the curriculum, is that the weight becomes skewed towards inclusion and representation, and less about critical dialogue with existing problematic dialogues and policies. So for effective change, one cannot happen without the other. We need a holistic approach. So tonight, as opposed to just speaking about my own work, I thought it would be nice to broaden the discussion to include other contemporary jewelry designers with a modernist approach. I have selected a handful of jewelers, makers and designers to cover the spectrum of modernist approaches within their jewelry practices. From the art deco echoes of the work of Satin Maturi through to brutalist and Afrofuturist approaches of Simone Webster and Ron Anderson of 10,000 Things. The work of Art Smith and Jacqueline Rayburn will lead the charge. But before we look at mapping modernism amongst these exemplars, 
we will look at the problems inherent in populist framing of the modernist movement more generally. So, modernism. Now, I'm including some references before we get into uh, looking at specific exemplars because I'm not making any assumptions about um, anyone's understanding of modernist movement and, and to some extent the different ways in which it operated um, in kind of the world, but also within the art context. So modernism is conceived both broadly as the cultural articulation of modernity. Uh, so the modern conditions of being and the ways of relating to the world that issued out of the 19th, out of 19th century Europe and then traveled around the world thanks to colonialism and the imperial project but also narrowly, um, and this is frequently designated by the capital M, as the bold experiment launched in the early 20th century that effectively did away with all conventions of the arts that existed prior to it. So for the purposes of this lecture, I will be looking more specifically at modernism with a capital M, with the visual, within the visual and applied arts and as a movement, and, and also as an approach within studio art jewelry, or as we think of it now, contemporary jewelry. So modernist artists, while seeking new visual, and so I'm gonna give some examples here. So we think of visual art, we think of sculpture, we think of architecture. So modernist artists, while seeking a new artistic visual language or renewal, rejected the classical idea of what art should be or was expected to be by the society at large. This attitude can be seen as a catalyst that propelled Western artists to look beyond their shores to seek new innovation. The Western artists saw an opportunity in incorporating primitivism or non-European art uh, in his work, tired of the established ideals in terms of what was permissible in the visual arts. He looked elsewhere for new technological, technological and technical approaches, inspiration and self-expression. He looked beyond the shores of his own world. So I use he, intentionally, but not unironically. When thinking of modernism, mostly male artists come to mind because they're the most things we hear about. Paul Gauguin, Henry Matisse, Pablo Picasso. Um, the modernist narrative centers predominantly around white European male artist experience. So it subsumes the work that was a catalyst for this transformation as merely objects of inspiration. If we look harder, we can find some women, Georgia O'Keeffe, Lord Jabu, Louise uh, Bourgeois, Barbara Hethwork, for example. But what we have to think about is that we cannot really think of modernism as a period without thinking of the engine behind the societies that birthed it. It is inextricably linked to imperialism and empire, the drive to expand your and, and the drive to expand European territory beyond its shores. So, and through this, these endeavors, um, so through colonialism of other continents, countries, the West, Europe, gained access to the artifacts of the cultures it colonized. This is true of Africa, the Americas, the East, and Oceania, which were all chartered, charted and colonized by Europe. So empire, alongside war, urbanization, and modernity itself, made modernism possible. So I'm going to speak about a period, um, a, an approach or a type of movement within modernism, which is referred to as primitivism. I will explain that is the term itself is problematic, but it's just helpful for us to reference it in terms of what you'll find in terms of writing and scholarship on this particular um, area within a kind of modernist approach. So. Primitivism was fostered during the modern period by two phenomena. First, the so-called age of discovery, which is when from the 15th to the 17th century, um, Europeans were brought into close contact with a wide array of previously unknown cultures from Asia, Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. The new social economic relationships established with these cultures were often exploitative, including theft of raw materials, enslavement, and colonial rules. Europeans commonly referred to African, Oceanic, and Indigenous North and South American cultures as primitive. Second, later, primitive ad primitivist attitudes were fostered by the anxieties caused 
by the rapid social, economic, and political changes that accompanied the scientific and industrial revolutions of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. So primitivism was a sort of antidote to modernity itself. It became a nostalgia for an imagined state of nature when humankind is assumed to have lived more in instinctively um, and in closer harmony with the natural and spiritual worlds. So as an art movement, it began in France in the later half of the 19th century and then traveled throughout Europe and America. So inherent in dialogues about primitivism is the underlying power exchanges that fostered this movement and the discrepancy between the fame and notoriety of the avant-garde artists and the prices that their works commanded, which were heavily reliant on their cross-cultural borrowings versus the literal anonymity of the makers of these artifacts. In most cases, we're talking about African um, artisans and artists and the mass that inspired their practices. So this is an example here. When you see them next to each other, you can see how close the, um, the kind of borrowing, as it were, um, is there. So there's another example here, which is quite a well-known example in discourse and talks about this subject. So primitivism also expanded to explore prehistoric Western past and contemporaneous peasant cultures. So there was other things that were also happening, other influences as well. Um, but the influence of a pervasive primitivist attitude has never really left us, despite changes within art since the inception of this movement. So what we can see is that modernism as an artistic visual language shared a colonialist path of exploiting primitivism to renew, to renew itself. This renewal was nonetheless a search for a new artistic visual language. So while modernism exploited the primitive through the incorporation of so-called primitive African or other kind of artistic features, in their kind of overall artworks produced towards and after the 20th century. Um, in a way, it's ironic that artists that drew inspiration from these cultures were also sim simultaneously denigrating them through the very ter terminology used to describe them. So one thing as well to keep in mind is that the artists inspired by um, these forms of art um, that they that were deemed to be primitive didn't typically make an effort to understand and respect their source material. It didn't seem to be important to many of these artists to learn more about the art and the artifacts they were engaging with, to understand the who's, the hows, and the whys. Instead, they took the aspects they liked and they dismissed the rest, often as inferior. So primitivism, therefore, is not to be confused with African-inspired artwork being created, by art, being created by artists of African ancestry at the same time. Yeah, that was happening at the same time, <laughs> but we don't see much of that. Um, so African art and by default, its artists have at times um, had their anonymous importance to, in the creation of modernism acknowledged. So it is acknowledged that, that this cultural barring was happening, but they didn't have the civilizational authority of the modern as part of that kind of dialogue. So this is easier to be done if you are deemed primitive and pre-modern. So much artistic criticism denied the possibility of non-Western modernisms, with modernism resolutely being attributed to artists generating through Western cosmopolitan frames of reference. So the concept of modernism was kind of, in a sense, relegated to very Western cosmopolitan like realities, if you like. So um, in a, to kind of support this, um, this idea or this kind of, not necessarily theory, but this kind of understanding, um, colonial ed education was reinforcing this because local artistic practices were either being suppressed or they were being relegated or contained to rudimentary definitions and categorized um, within craft and folk art practices. So now this became an issue because any artist or local artist 
who was deviating from traditional approaches often fell into a chasm. So their work was not authentic enough to be part of the local historical canon, but it was not sophisticated enough due to the use of certain culturally, culturally relevant techniques or approaches to have a contemporary, contemporary relevance outside of the local context and to achieve the status of modern art. So uh, in general, in this singular monocultural narrative, um, unless it was relevant for consumption by Western artists as research or inspiration, there was a general tendency to dismiss work from the margins, right? So it became very centralized around cosmopolitan areas and around um, kind of Eurocentric art movements. So, sorry, I catch my thing. Um, so any art that was produced in a recognizably modernist style during the 20th century by formerly colonized and indigenous peoples was systematically sidelined and to some extent has continued to be regarded as belated or provincial. So scope within modernism has been limited, like I said, to the modernist artists that arose within the so-called intellectual and networked spheres of Europe and the Americas. So what is happening now is that there is a renewed interest in redefining the scope and aims of modernism, so-called new modernist studies. So as scholars from the margins of the field have interrogated modernism's Eurocentric bias and question whether it was whether its original terms of analysis are adequate to take into consideration the complexities of a modernism that was in practice um, conceived and mobilized more globally. So there is this questioning of, and this is not just within modernism, but more generally, um, of a, this idea of a linear kind of approach or a center periphery model in terms of how it's been, um, how it is understood, where things traveled from Europe to, to the margins or traveled from Europe to the colonies or tr things traveled from the center, which was Europe out, outwards. So this is being questioned. Um, so the conventional tale of modernist movements dissemination from Europe to the rest of the world, um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> So what, it's, what they're saying is in its place, we need to look at a transnational and transhistorical revision of the story of modernism. Um, and a theory around what is considered a dynamic internationalism, which is centered around the Atlantic has formed. So this is talking about back and forth movement across a body of water. So not only were there simultaneous modernisms, but although modernism was inextricably tied with colonialism, it was also transformed by it, and it was synthesized in colonized and then later decolonized countries with localized forms and approaches. So I'm going to talk very briefly. Um, about triangular trade and this idea of the Black Atlantic, which is also tied to notions about globalization. So the term triangular trade, I think some of you or many of you might be familiar with elements of this. Um, it describes the Atlantic trade routes between three different countries or destinations. So these trade routes covered Britain, Europe, Africa, and the Americas, and the West Indies are what is now called the Caribbean. Um, so in what we refer to as the age of sail, so it's different to now, winds and ocean currents shaped the direction of these routes. So they, was, they were only traveling in certain directions because of the technology of the vessels in which they were moving. So the first stage was between Europe and Africa with a cargo of manufactured goods. The second stage was between Africa and the New World, and this involved transportation of the enslaved and is known in regards to the transatlantic economy built upon this enslavement as the Middle Passage. And the third stage is between Caribbean, the Caribbean and North America, intertrade between these regions and then from these colonial outposts back to Europe with raw materials and the products of the labor of these enslaved individuals. So the Atlantic economy 
which was founded on the labor of the enslaved sparked the biggest changes in our modern economic history. Many goods and commodities came out of this triangle of trade, but what, is meant for British, what it meant for British manufacturing was a sea change. Cotton production fueled the Industrial Revolution and became Britain's greatest export industry. And the Atlantic economy became the nucleus and the first stage in the development of our current global economy. It is the basis of the major economies of America and Western Europe. So this concept of the Black Atlantic is a term first used by Robert Francis and then expanded upon by Robert Gilroy and others. So in 2010, the Tate Liverpool hosted Afro Modern Journeys Through the Black Atlantic. This was a major exhibition and citywide program of parallel exhibitions and events. Um, it was inspired by Paul Gilroy's book, which is called The Black Atlantic Modernism and Double Consciousness. And the exhibition focused on the culture formed between Africa, the Caribbean, Europe, and North and South America. And it was the first exhibition to trace in depth the impact of Black Atlantic culture on modernism. And it revealed how Black artists and intellectuals have played a central role in the formation of modernism from the early 20th century until today. So this concept describes the fusion of Black cultures with other cultures from around the Atlantic. It also refers to a recrossing of the Atlantic creatively um, of Black consciousness and the resultant central role in the formation of modernism. It argues that contemporary Black artists endlessly explore and redefine notions of Blackness by sampling and recycling a wide range of sources from Black vernacular, popular culture and history, as well as both Eurocentric modernisms and what is referred to as Black Atlantic modernism or tropical modernism. So a defining characteristic of Black Atlantic culture relates to what W.E. Du Bois refers to as double consciousness. So that is about existing both within and also outside of dominant culture. So I have some examples here, some art. This is art from earlier on, like the 19th, um, the 20th century, but also, oops, sorry, more contemporary, contemporaneously. with a piece that was exhibited earlier this year at Christie's in New York. So one, one can argue that Black culture and the art and aesthetic styles of Africa and its diaspora are still shaping society from musical genres and fashion to the arts, and that Black modernism is the expression of intersectional interactions of Black people across geographies, from homelands to cosmopolitan spaces. And now, no, some of you probably like, when we're getting to the jewelry. So modernist jewelry. Um, so to come back to modernism and jewelry, it was during this period that artists such as Man Ray, Salvador Dali, and Georges Braque began to delve into the world of jewelry in a move that would reconcile fine art with the applied art of jewelry design. In turn, this would lead to a revival of individual craftsmanship and the re-emergence of, re of the artisan jeweler during the 1950s and 60s. So in the wake of the Second World War, a vastly changed society emerged, one which was fast-paced, defiantly opposed to many of the traditional aspects of pre-war life. Individuality was prized, thereby granting jewelers a creative freedom to experiment with shape, form, and texture. Technological advancements and the dawn of space exploration led to futuristic designs appearing in jewelry, and across the wider decorative arts, further reinforcing the vogue for unusual gemstone combinations and unconventional forms. Defined by its originality of design, modernist jewelry was born out of a newly found freedom of expression that was thriving in this period. So modernist jewelers sought to move away from traditional jewelry design, drawing inspiration from bur burgeoning artistic movements, and in many cases, prioritizing the visual impact and craftsmanship of the piece over the wealth of materials used to create it. So modernist jewelers felt they had more in common with painters, sculptors, and other modernist art, other modern artists of the day. And their ambitious goal was to create one of the kind works of art that people would wear. So purity of line, modernist principles within jewelry are purity of line and form, rejection of surface ornamentation, 
the influence of mathematics and primitivism comes back, all found a home within this new jewelry. So it was characterized by strong, strong geometric forms, emphasizing angles and lines, abstract compositions, and a linear vocabulary. So later we saw more shapely forms creep in with curves, curls, and spirals, and a rediscovery of the Art Deco style. But modernism within jewelry was not all about abstraction and clay lines. Also within modernism are the data and surrealist movements and dataism and surrealism provided a counterbalance to kind of other forms of modernism that were more kind of, um, what's the word? Like, <laughs> like, I guess had more restrictions to them. Um, and contemporary jewelry was also shaped by this as well. So, Um, there is a tendency to think of um, modernism solely as a movement within Europe and North America means that many narratives get left out of the picture. I can count on one hand the number of black jewelers I've come across in books dedicated to modern or contemporary jewelry. This is not like an exaggeration for this talk, but what was happening elsewhere in the world during this time is not really reflected within mainstream discourse. So therefore, it renders it to somewhat, somewhat seemingly inconsequential within most areas of study and research. Um, one exception I think probably would to, to this would be the prominence of um, some of the modernist jewelers that came out of Brazil. So we have uh, H. Stern and, and Burl Marx. Um, and in Britain, when you think of modernism, you saw the slides earlier here. Um, you might think of Paul Brand, Charles the Temple, Andrew Grima, Wendy Ramshaw, Dorothy Hogg, David Watkins, John Donald, Gerda Flockinger, to name a few. Um, I'm not going to get into Scandinavia and wider northern European stalwarts, the list is too long, but um, what is even more telling is when prominent influential makers outside of, of the hegemony are left out of the story. So while we might think of Margaret de Pata or, and Sam Kramer when we think of American modernist jewelry, um, further we'll know of Arthur Smith or as we know him, Art Smith. So a contemporary of Sam Kramer and also influential in the modernist jewelry movement. Um, oh, sorry, this to bring it further over here. Um, Art Smith's jewelry ranged from simple silver neck rings to biomorphic pieces that drew from African motifs. So I'll just kind of talk a bit about Art Smith and then I'll pull up the pictures of him after. Um, so Art Smith made small pieces such as cufflinks and earrings. Uh, many of his best works were large enough to wrap around the body. Um, human form uh, was kind of an important part of kind of the backdrop for his creations in a sense that he saw them as, as working with the body and he created them so that they became a sculpture once worn. Um, he was an African-American um, who grew up in North New York City and Smith took his inspiration from African tribal art and costume and he worked as a costume designer for several black dance companies in New York which allowed him to experiment with his, which is, with his favorite theme which was movement. So his work was very large and sculptural but designed to sit well and as I said move with the body. Um, and any mention of Art Smith must include his mentor, Winifred Mason Chinette. So she is believed to be the first commercial black jeweler in the US. Chinette discovered her talents as an art jeweler while teaching metalsmithing to children um, at Junior Achievement Worldwide, where she also met her future assistant and mentee, Art Smith. Um, she then went on uh, with a grant from Rosenwald Fund um, to travel and research so she immersed herself in West Indian and Haitian cultures and expressed these discoveries through her jewelry. And in fact, she had, she worked as a um, commercial jewelry designer in the US, but she also made a fabricated jewelry in Haiti and had a shop in Haiti that sold modern jewelry as well. So hopefully someone can help me with the, <laughs> with the images in a second, sorry about that. I don't want to go too far ahead of the pictures. And would you help if uh, you answer the question? 
Yes. So, so he was um, operating in like, she was operating, they basically started in the 50s and 60s. And then he continued like from there. So kind of early, early modern American modernist kind of period. Okay, so I'll just go through some of the images of his pieces. So these are some of his earrings. Um, as you can see, it ranged from um, quite simple forms. Um, this is um, a ring of his, which was also in the Brilliant and Black of Jewelry Renaissance exhibition, um, which was in New York in September, well, through September and October. And actually um, the catalog and some of the pieces are still available to purchase online. So you can always kind of look back at, at, at some of those references after the talk. Um, and this is, as you can, I was talking earlier about some of the pieces that were like sculpted around the body. This is another necklace um, of his. So um, I'm going to focus on now some contemporaneous um, black jewelers um, from Africa and the diaspora. Um, so what I want us to think about is Whilst the mainstream art world admits and even celebrates the hybrid appropriations of European and Eurocentric modernists, um, there is an often a two-way dialogue. When the gaze is reversed, the response is not always the same. Why are the not same freedoms not afforded? Um, as discussed earlier, the dynamic is more complex and the realities for artists from Africa and the wider, wider diaspora are complex. This reversal of the colonial gaze can be a site of resistance and affirmation. And we as artists um, of this group should not be held to other notions of what is and is an authentic frames of reference for us. And our practices should not be siloed into boxes based upon race, culture, or perceived identity. Um, it is enough to already be othered by traditional discourse. So I will be highlighting a handful of jewelers as exemplars working with a modernist approach. There are many more I could discuss, but um, time <laughs> precludes me and obviously now we're kind of crunch time but um my first person i'm going to talk about is jacqueline rayborn so jacqueline rayborn's first collection raw elegance was presented in 1991 at barney's in new york um, and ever since her fluid conceptual forms and poetic approach to design have become her signature her body of work is split between a collaboration with George Jorg jensen an epoch defining heritage brand Danish heritage brand known for its modernist aesthetic and its collaborations with modernist designers and architects. And um, her work with them uh, began in 1999 and her first collection for them, Offspring, launched shortly after. Offspring is still the best-selling collection in the 117-year history of Jorgensen. So her, her work is split between her collaboration with this heritage house and her own uh, collections. So her influences include uh, Scandinavian style, mid-century modern design, and minimalist architecture. And she sees parallels between the simplicity and resolution of form often associated with Scandinavian design and the forms of ancient African jewelry. So for her, jewelry is a talisman and a form of protection going beyond adornment. And she feels there is something very spiritual about the journey of arriving at the purest expression of an idea. She sees the process of creating a piece of jewelry as going within. So her collection Black Love launched in 2015 and it came out of a rising public awareness of police brutality in the US. So the piece is on your left, <laughs> my right. Um, our part of the initial launch. This bracelet here is part of uh, three pieces she did. She, she redid three pieces from the Black Love collection for the Sotheby's Brilliant and Black. This bracelet is one of them it has sold. So um, another collection of hers um, is called Beautiful Life. And this collection um, is a ring which comprises of three movable parts that are united to create a single form. And the two outer forms are separated by a slender single ring, signifying the importance of offering space and compassion in all relationships. And another earlier collection of hers with Jörg Janssen, Mercy has recently been re released. There is a pop-up shop in London 
that contains some of the pieces of the Mercy um, collection. So the next person I am going to talk about is Sato Maturi of Maturi Fine Jewelry. So before Sato's father became managing director of De Beers for its West Africa operation spanning Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, he was an architect. If you, I feel you can see the discipline of an architect in Sato's approach. She, um, so Sato followed in her father's footsteps originally, um, not only with experience working in diamonds and for De Beers, but in the conceptions of architectural forms, albeit of the jewelry variety. Um, her work is characterized as African imagining of the Art Deco, interpreting European Art Deco motifs via an African gaze and symb symbology. So these earrings here on the side here um, can often be seen graces, gracing the lobes of Rihanna and her most recent collection, uh, Whisper, this is one example of some of the pieces from Whispers of Moreau, is an exploration of the rich history of ancient Egypt and the greater Upper Nile, not um, the gilded land of the pharaohs that has so often been plundered for inspiration, but the Nubian dynasty and its stories of female power, resilience, and loss of, of opulence. Another one of her earrings um, is currently in the Force of Nature exhibition at the Elisabetta Cipriani Gallery. Um, they are called Kandak earrings. And um, I'm particularly drawn to the geometry of these <laughs> earrings myself, being a fan of triangles, but I'll come to that later. Um, Simone Brewster is an artist and designer known across a number of mediums, large scale sculptural furniture, object to art, painting and jewelry. Her fascination with making and her memories of the workshop are what took her back into education from her work in architecture. Jewelry came to her swiftly upon graduating from the RCA with an MA in design products, first in wood and then in precious metals with both, um, both yes, sculpture and architectural. So she has a wider practice. Um, I'm worried about time, so I'm not going to go into some of the painting and furniture things, but just going to explain that her furniture draws on um, African sculpture and primitivism and cubism and the functional sculptural pieces that deconstruct the black female body. Just see if I have this is some of her jewelry. Um, so I'm kind of going to skip about a little bit about the furniture, but uh, basically her work seeks to reclaim identity suppressed by colonialism and appropriated by early 20th century artists. She sees this work as a living in the gaps that history has left open a lack of objects from her perspective that, a lack of objects that are in the cat, like in the space from her perspective. So that of a black female, a view from a voice of a Londoner with Caribbean parents who has grown up in a multicultural society. So next I'm gonna to come to Ron Anderson. Um, Ron Anderson of 10,000 Things. So Ron uh, works, with David Rees um, as a partnership. So, but Ron himself has been making jewelry for over 30 years and he began collaborating with David Rees in 1990 and together they founded the jewelry line 10,000 Things. Their stated goal has always been to reveal and revel in the beauty of the natural elements they use not to overwhelm with metal, which is why many of the pieces look naked and unadorned. It is entirely intentional. Um, they work together, they work on things together, but also individually. So the pieces that I've included here are pieces that Ron has worked on individually with the exception of one piece, which I'll explain about later. And they highlight his minimalistic approach. So one of Ron's overriding themes, themes and preoccupations is movement. Even with the simplest earring, he makes, their, he makes a con concentrated effort with, within fabrication of the elements to encourage this movement. Um, so these, these chandelier earrings, so this one here, the metal one, is kind of the initial one that launched a series of chandelier earrings. Um, and these larger, now these are very large scale. They're about this big. They uh, were also in Brilliant and Black at Sotheby's and um, they, they sold very quickly when the show opened. 
But I wanted to also talk about a couple of other projects that 10,000 Things is working on. So this is a ring that was a collabor collaborative effort between Ron and David and also with gem cutters um, in Jaipur in India. So they worked on it together. Um, but in terms of collaboration, they have recently um, launched some jewelry as part of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts exhibition before yesterday we could fly an Afrofuturist period room. So this um, exhibition relates to um, Seneca Village. So some people might have heard of Seneca Village, but just to explain what Seneca, Seneca Village was. Seneca Village was a 19th century community of predominantly Black landowners and tenants. It was in what is now Central Park. It was a site of opportunity, ownership, freedom and prosperity. And in 1857, the city of New York sees the land displacing the residents to make way for Central Park. Um, prior to this displacement was the earlier wholesale displacement of the Lenape people from their ancestral land. So this exhibition um, is powered by Afrofuturism um, and it imagines what might have happened had the village been able to thrive into the present and beyond. And even though it's a period room like other period rooms um, within the Met, this room rejects the notion of one historical period and embraces the African, African diasporic belief that the past, present and future are interconnected. I've just included two examples of some of the pieces that um, Ron and David have been working on as part of this exhibition and also artifacts that are available, available for purchase um, around that. So, I'm going to talk a bit about the trajectory of my work and inspirations. So I think of my work as a practice, much as a sculptor would think of their work. Um, I just happen to be working with precious materials and designing sculptural pieces for the body. Um, much of my work is informed by a relationship to architecture, how we inhabit architectural spaces and how they transform our environments, both in the rural and urban landscapes. And I have a particular focus on how geometry is used explicitly in the creation of sacred spaces to foster a sense of solace, peace, and spiritual experience. So this focus stems from my interest in the function of jewelry beyond adornment, and thus my pieces work towards creating experiences for the wearer and the viewer in regards to how we engage and respond to sculptural forms on the body. So my interest in architecture is kind of quite on like the on a meta level <laughs> um, in that architecture has two meanings essentially it can be about the art and practice of designing and constructing buildings but it also refers to a carefully designed structure of something jewelry is intimate architecture the design of structures for the body and that's kind of the modus operandi that i operate from um, but my work more widely also engages with other senses of place and in particular, memories of experiences of places and interactions. So for me, geometry is really the key. Um, it's a key in a practical sense in how I create forms, but also a key in the wider sense of how we com comprehend this vast world around us. So when you think of the term geometry, essentially it was about the measurement of the earth. It was about measuring the land. And that is to some extent where my interaction with geometry and like kind of our ideas of the natural world kind of stem from. So it's dimension, proportion, growth patterns, both man-made and organic. Um, and I work with geometric constructions to realize my pieces. Sometimes they are layered and the forms are derived from the spaces between the geometric constructions that I do. And other times I work with 2D templates created um, from dynamic deconstructions of golden section rectangles that are folded and formed in sheet metal, like the brooch that I'm wearing, <laughs> into 3D forms. So when we think of Bermuda, people might be surprised that I would be exposed to world-class contemporary art in Bermuda. These are sketches drawn, done by Georgia O'Keeffe of, of a banyan tree in Bermuda. She did spend time in Bermuda um, as an artist, mostly on studies. Um, so a number of artists spent time in Bermuda. I was lucky enough to take a summer job during research for a growing art foundation in Bermuda. And in addition to manning the desk in a gallery space, 
I also got time to spend time doing contextual research, searching archives and records, mostly microfiche at the National Library, compiling information of the travel of various artists to Bermuda. So Albert Glises, Charles Demuth, Georgia O'Keeffe, Marston Hartley, Jack Bush, E. Ambrose Webster, and Bermuda's own resident modernist, well-known artist, Alfred Birdsey. So I'm also struck by the simplicity of architecture in Bermuda, relatively adorned in the landscape, in stark contrast because of the quality of light. So while I was undertaking this summer job for this local Bermuda Arts Foundation, my mom sent me to pick up some jewelry pairs for her at the gem cellar. That chance errand led me to a career in jewelry. Chet Trot, the owner, recognizing my interest in the subject, invited me to come back one Saturday to bring with me some pieces that I had made and to find out more about how jewelry is made. I had made these pieces in like high school, like art class. So I ended up working there Saturdays that summer. Um, and then after that summers and holidays while studying at university in Canada. So just before my final year of university, the penny dropped and I realized I wanted to work in jewelry. I completed my degree, as I mentioned earlier, in English and comparative studies, and then came back to Bermuda to work in jewelry. Uh, first at Gem Cellar and then uh, at a, later at a larger company that had many jewelry stores on the island called Crescents. So Chet Trot, a very talented black jeweler and business owner, was my route into jewelry. And I can't say for certainty that I would ever have embarked on this journey had it not been for his support and guidance of my tentative and fledgling dreams. So Chet apprenticed at Trimingham's and had trained and increased the master of his trade until he was able to purchase Gem Cellar from Brian Shadbolt. So Brian Shadbolt, upon his return to the UK, went on, went on to found Niagara Falls Casting. So some of you may have heard of that uh, casting company and, you know, it's kind of known within UK kind of jewelry um, sector and industry. And also, just to kind of come back to Bermuda, and when you're from somewhere small that's seen as from the margins, it may seem like it's not relevant. Um, so when Stuart Devlin was, Stuart Levin is no longer with us, he's a very well-known silversmith and also to some extent jeweler. I recall discussing trimming M's with him many years ago, and he had fond recollections of this Bermuda stockist of his silver. So Chet's father, Chesley Trot, is a leading Bermuda sculptor. Um, this is one of his pieces. And my grandmother owns one of his cedar sculptures, which graces our family home in Bermuda. So I'm gonna just talk about a few of my jewelry pieces. So these gold faceted rings, one of which, the one there on that far side, um, is an archive piece from 2009. It, it, it was or is in the show Force of Nature. Um, it sold on Saturday. Um, my work began with these sculptural pieces devoid of ornamentation, uh, initially in sterling silver and then in gold. Um, and this is a continual and continuous thread in my work. So I continue to work in both metals, both silver um, and gold. And, um, and also alongside more intricate gem pieces, which I'll come to. But um, I haven't just simply moved into working with gemstones. I continue to work on sculptural forms that don't, have, that don't include gemstones. And it's a really important aspect of my work. So this is the palmetto ring. So this ring is one of the rings that I made for the exhibition Sotheby's, at Sotheby's Brilliant and Black of Jewelry Renaissance. Um, the, this ring was inspired by Bermuda, um, but the color palette, so the purple, the, the amethyst is actually reminiscent of the palmetto berries, um, and also to some extent, like kind of our intense sunset. So this is the palmetto tree. I don't know if you can see, well, these don't have any berries on them, but you just have the stalks left, but um, they, they go a very dark, um, they ripen to a very deep purple in the autumn in Bermuda. And in the past, these berries were used to produce a local wine called Vibe. And um, Sabal Bermuda Anna, Bermuda Anna, which is the name for this tree, um, is the Bermuda Palmetto. So this was an invaluable source of food, wine, rope, roof thatch, and household goods to 17th century settlers in Bermuda. Its leaves were central to the 18th century plaiting and hat making industry. It's now an endangered species in Bermuda. 
um, and forests of the Bermuda palmetto once occurred widely in Bermuda and for thousands of years. We now have small patches of palmetto forest that can still be found on nature reserves on the island. So these earrings are the Bermudiana earrings. So um, just to explain in this description, I will make reference to the execution of an enslaved person just so that you have a bit of a warning about that. So the Bermudiana earrings were inspired also by Bermuda. The color palette is reminiscent of this particular flower, which is called the Bermudiana flower. So this flower is a small member of the iris family and the Bermudiana flower blooms in the spring and it's endemic to the island. It's Bermuda's national flower. The oldest specimen of this plant is one collected by John Dickinson in 1699 and it's preserved in the Sloan Herbarium at the British Museum of Natural History. So the Bermudiana flower is inextricably linked with the story of Sarah Bassett, or as she is known in Bermuda, Sally Bassett. So Sally Bassett was an enslaved woman who was burned at the stake in 1730 um, by the government of the Bermuda for allegedly attempting to poison her granddaughters and slavers. So she, in a sense, it, uh, it's kind of like a folk hero, I would say, in Bermuda, but also more widely in the Caribbean. So, and basically there was an account from this, this um, event, which was recounted in the paper and that that spread throughout the Caribbean. So as she was brought to the stake where she, you know, she commented to the people who were rushing to, to, to view or witness her execution, and she said, there's no use you hurrying folks, there'll be no fun till I get there. Her words were immortalized in, this, in the local paper, which was very rare for someone who was enslaved. And as a consequence, word of her execution and her comments made its way to the Bahamas and other colonial islands, which subsequently experienced insurrections after this, um, after this kind of news had traveled. They had taken inspiration from Sally Bassett's unbothered attitude and she became a folk hero and an unwitting catalyst for revolution. So Sally declared her in innocence until the very end. Later, when Sally's ashes were to be removed, a purple blue iris, the Bermudiana flower, was observed to be growing in their midst. The flower blooms are all around Bermuda every spring, and some legends persist that the flower is a sign of her in innocence. Um, so it's very, it's very tied in to, with Bermuda culture, the, the flower, and also the story of Sally Bassett. So just gonna one more piece. So these uh, are Trinity, these bangles are called Trinity. They were a set of bangles I also made for, um, for Sotheby's Brilliant and Black. Um, for me, the sound of bangles jingling um, is always associated with my grandmother, or I call her Nana, um, Myrtle Ednis. So, um, some you know, she's always had a silver stack of them up her arm. It's a picture of her here. Um, so sometimes more, sometimes less, and she is 107, she still wears her bangles. Um, so bangles were some of my first pieces of jewelry. The custom in Bermuda, like much of the Caribbean, of giving them as gifts to small children meant that I received them from family and godparents as a child. I still have many of those first bangles. Um, when I set off from Bermuda to study in Canada, I had my bangles with me, both those I had been given over the years as gifts, but also a pair my nana had taken off and given to accompany me. So two of these bangles were first designed at my MA degree show at Central St. Martin's 14 years ago, and they were joined by a newly designed and created bangle to form this trinity. So when you work in an abstract way, people may not immediately see your heritage or culture as inherent in your approach. Initially outside of discussing the processes by which I realized the forms of my jewelry and the inspirations behind these systems I have developed, I have to some extent kept quiet about my wider inspirations. As I grow in age and experience, I've gained the confidence to share more about the origins of the ideas and the wider inspirations that drive these developments. So kind of gonna coming to a conclusion. Um, so perhaps you have seen some reoccurring themes and words in this lecture. I hope you'll take some time to reflect on some of the concepts and core approaches within the work discussed alongside some of the concepts I provided earlier in this talk, 
on modernism and primitivism, the triangular trait and the Black Atlantic. If you do, you will see the, see the ways in which a modernist approach is applied in the work of the jewelry artists I have featured and my own work. Not everything has to be explicit to be powerful and meaningful. So I'm just going to mention a few things that might be of relevance kind of leading off from this lecture. So we have some people in the audience who are included in this as well. Um, so the Black Artisans um, is a photography project and also film project that showcases and celebrates established UK Black artisans through a traveling photo photography exhibition launched at the William Morris Gallery, it has toured public libraries and other community-based venues, a selection of, from this project of female artisans and a picture and piece of someone in this audience, <laughs> um, is, currently on this, is currently showcased as part of the We Gather at the Crafts Council, We Gather exhibition at the Crafts Council Allen Gallery, which is now open and will run until February. I don't have the exact date, but um, so, my image is, is included in this, but there's a selection of pieces as well as images um, there. So I'm going to mention, I mentioned earlier, I referred to, just wanted to show a picture of some of the artists that were involved in this seminal exhibition. So this was a selling exhibition, exhibition at Sotheby's. Uh, it was envisioned and curated by Melanie Gratt. It is the first of its kind dedicated to showcasing the extraordinary, extraordinary skill, imagination, and craftsmanship of black jewelry designers. I, quite a few of the people I mentioned in my talk were involved in that exhibition, as well as the pioneers, um, Winifred Mason, Jeanette, and Art Smith. They had pieces from their archive in this show. Um, so it was 21 of like kind of designers and makers um, that were involved in this exhibition. As I mentioned, the catalog and many of the pieces from this exhibition are still available to view and to some extent purchase online. I think what's way, okay, the next one. So Force of Nature is on right now. So what I wanted to mention is that while it's important that we are supported on platforms to showcase our work, it is also important that we are included holistically within important exhibitions and collections. So this is me grinning uh, and being very overexcited at having a picture taken next to Wallace Chan. Um, so I had to include that because it was incredibly exciting. Probably not showing it as much on my face as I was feeling inside. But um, so this uh, Melanie Grant, as I mentioned, was the curator and Envision uh, Black and Brilliant Sotheby's. Um, and what she's doing with Force of Nature by showcasing both artists who work, very well-known artists who work in, in as with jewelry as a medium as well as uh, contemporary jewelers is in a sense, looking to dismantle the barriers between art and jewelry and to kind of challenge the hierarchy that elevates some artists above others. So this closes tomorrow. <laughs> I think some of the pieces will be extended in the gallery, but the actual, actual exhibition uh, it features 40 uh, jewels by 17 contemporary artists. I mentioned We Gather earlier, so this is until the 5th of February, this is on at the Crafts Council. So there's work on, but there's also um, other information about craft practices um, by female kind of Black craft practitioners. Um, um, so one of the other things I wanted to say that's really interesting in terms of looking at how to support this community is that it's not just about the prominence and representation of those making and designing jewelry, but it's also about other people within the jewelry sector. So we now have uh, jewelry editors and curators, like I mentioned, Melanie Grant. Um, so other editors are Tanya Dukes, Mazzy Odu, Shelton Boyd Griffith. If you're interested in following, you know, who they're covering, you can Kind of find them on Instagram. Um, Mazzy has written long kind of, uh, she, in addition to writing for magazines, she also has her own platform where she puts long interviews and she has, she's done one on me, but she's also done one on Jacqueline and Sata. So if you're interested in reading more about their practices, you can find them through 
her platform, which is called Magnus Oculus. But if you just look up Nancy OG on Instagram, you can get links to it. Um, we also need more jewelry academics and researchers within national institutions. Um, but one of the things that's really important is the recognition of black jewelry artists while they're, while they're still living is imperative. Often they get acclaim and recognition comes posthumously. In the case of Art Smith, he didn't get as much recognition while he was still practicing as he did after. So we are seeing some changes on this front. We have Emma Foucault with work now in two prominent permanent collections, the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Goldsmiths Company collection. So change is afoot, but we need critical theory, research and scholarship to support this paradigm shift. And that is me. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. Um, Well, you were saying that uh, it was, um, you didn't want to have this thing that plays some artists in the numbers. Mm -hmm. But when I see all the exhibitions, it's always the same names. So, how do you go along with selections or doing maybe a local post so that other people? Do you, do you mean Melanie Grant or do you mean me? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> in general. Okay. Um, you mean, and, and well, for me, I'm not often in a position where I'm curating the exhibition, so sometimes I'm asked to participate. I think with, exhibi with exhibitions, well, we're looking essentially at like a new frontier with some of these exhibitions. We've only really started having some of the exhibitions in the last six months or so. So it, to some extent, it's like kind of early. Um, days. I think initially um, when people are brokering, uh, often it's not entirely the entirely up to the person who's the creator. When people are brokering like relationships with established, like um, there is some to, some to some extent some negotiation. So galleries will want certain prominent names to bring in certain collectors. So they'll have to balance like who they bring in with who the galleries feel will bring in like a certain audience. So I think like initially when people are starting to, to make these seminal kind of exhibitions and they're trying to get, like just get on the platforms to start with, there's a little bit of negotiation. And I think as more and more momentum is created, people will have more license and freedom to kind of include like whoever they wanted. Like I know from speaking to Melanie, she had a very limited amount of people that she had to include. For some of them, she had to include certain price points you know, there was, there was, there was criteria to some extent. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Tanya, that sort of maybe snaps towards my question. I mean, I've, I've actually heard of Art Smith, but my question, I'm yes. yeah. uh, really aware of, of, of his, his decade. Yeah. Um, but I get, I get the feeling from what you've been saying that in a way he was one of your first real modern children. Um, like, sorry, sorry. I mean, yeah, I would like that we know of. I, I think mean, that's the sure. thing, yeah. So, sorry, the question is, yeah. I mean, how did he do it? I mean, there is a lot of stuff there that seems that he's working in, 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 in the base battle. Yes, yeah. I mean, how did he, how did he get his work? I mean, was well, he all to, 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 uh, well, uh, when he, his location helped, he was in Greenwich, he had a studio in Greenwich Village. Okay. So he had a studio amongst other artists and contemporaries. So there was kind of like a culture, to some right. extent, an exchange of like people who would come to look at, you know, one someone's work would then be introduced to him. But I think we also have to understand the um, influence of Winifred Kenneth Mason, who was his mentor, because she was a commercial jewelry designer and had like agency to some extent. I think she was also able to some extent to like elevate his position and introduce him. Like she was making collections for large kind of companies. So I think the, in a way that speaks to what I think for me has, was a transformative experience in that having the right mentor or having the right kind of support system when you're first starting out, when you're from kind of that community can be really like beneficial. 
for confidence building, but also in terms of helping to, it's one of the issues that people often talk about that are from these backgrounds is not having the network, not having the connections to be able to get in front of the right people or get onto the right platforms. And part of that is, is about, in a sense, patronage, not necessarily someone buying your work, but someone supporting you yeah. to help you to kind of get into the right galleries or, or get to know the right people. And she, she actually helped him move away from just going to church. I mean, across yeah. the states, plus... Yeah, I mean, he, churches. I don't, off the top of my head, have that, in, but he's in, like, national collections in, in America. Like, his yeah. pieces are held in museums. So, and he has a large collector base as well. Like, he has collectors who collect his pieces that collect other contemporary um, art, jewelry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned Jacqueline's collaboration with uh, Eugene Jensen. Yeah. Um, and it seems like a lot of these kind of modernist um, designers, their stuff is more sort of fringe and I guess sort of the mainstream jewelry houses aren't really doing much, mm. I don't know, this modernist kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, is a collaboration like this something you would like to do in the future or do you know of any I think, I think there's two different things in your question. One is is the interactions between like more contemporary jewelry with like more commercial fine jewelry, and they don't always necessarily like kind of cross and interact like um, kind of effectively. You do actually have what's happening now, um, not so much from big design houses, but from smaller new um, like developments. At the moment, they're not working like in like in higher kind of price points, but you have like Motley. Have you heard of Motley who are like collaborating with kind of individual independent jewelers or designer makers? Um, there's a new one called Cast that's launched recently. That's also doing the same thing. Cast is both of them in a way like yet your Jensen take over the manufacturer. So essentially you are working with them as a designer. And you're collaborating with them and then that, that is really the depending on what you want in terms of your practice in terms of the outcome that is that can really be transformative in terms of your reach because like most independent jewelers have a limited amount of pieces that they can make themselves they might be subcontract some contracting people out to help them but they're not going to be able to make at scale yeah. once you kind of collaborate with someone who has access to that kind of manufacturing kind of base, then you then can like, um, in a way, have more global outreach. Like, I don't know if you have talked about that recently. I, I think Winifred Mason and Jacqueline are probably, that I can think of the only examples of like, the least black women that have collaborated in that way. I don't know, I could be wrong. There could be some that I don't know about, but, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. You you do have it happen with some independent. Like I'm trying to think of um, like well, she wasn't really. I guess as an artist, if you think of um, of uh, why well, can't I think of her name? Well, I'm thinking of Pal Paloma Picasso, and um, I know the name, but it's completely escapes me. <laughs> Right now, Elsa Peretti, like, like, but in, it, it, they tend to not necessarily be from a jewelry specific background, but more from like a broader design, fashion, or like art background. But it would be good if, if we could have more of that. Yeah, definitely. I think for some of those things, depending on how you're placed, it doesn't necessarily hurt to reach out, like, and see if people would be interested, like, in that kind of thing with a small, not necessarily like taking you on as a full time designer but with a small like collection if you had the right if you could position it in the right way I think now is a time where people are probably more interested in engaging with those kinds of new voices coming in in a sense there's a pressure on um on some houses to be seen to be like working with new voices from different kinds of communities and so did that answer your question kind of yeah okay Any questions? Are we working with different kinds of communities or different types of um, art? Or Pardon, I didn't hear the first part of that question. You mentioned that um, we, we need to see more like Helen Picasso with Elsa Peretti 
and then you went on to say that about the collaboration and, yes. and wanting to work with people from different types of communities. You mean companies? Yeah. yeah. But I'm wondering if there's ever going to be any interest in different types of craft or jewelry. When you look at companies, really, you have to look at what their what their kind of modus operandi. Like usually, they have a bottom line. They have a certain amount. So it depends what you want for your practice. Like it's it, if you're working with a company, to some extent, you're going to have to go with what their outcomes are and how you in, how you engage with that. I mean, if you're looking at work, if you're looking at just driving your own kind of outcomes, then you might want to look at a collaboration with a gallery or another platform where you would be able to have more direction over the content that you make and you would have more freedom over what you're doing. But if, if you're collaborating with a commercial entity, essentially it's going to be driven by their aims and objectives and you will be contributing your voice or your thoughts within that paradigm. Like, I know what you're saying, that's, that's the ideal situation, but I think, I don't know if we're yet there where independence can kind of come in and really push that far just yet, especially within jewelry. I mean, you see it more happening within um, kind of furniture and homewares and other things where people kind of get given more leniency. I think most jewelry companies tend to have their own design teams. It is opening up more and more, but I think not as much, I think, as other kind of uh, areas. Yeah. Uh, you asked at the beginning, you said um, institutions often their curriculum didn't encourage quality and diversity. What would you recommend to, in the, maybe the subject of jewelry to encourage? Yeah, I think, well, part of it is like, it's just not necessarily talking about the same, the same couple of like modernist designers. You know, I think as well, there's, there's a tendency to look to the past and not necessarily look at like, exemplars that are closer to the people that are studying. So one of the things we've talked about a lot in this space is that um, there's a tendency generally, now I wouldn't say necessarily morally has this approach, I think, but in, in particular with certain kinds of higher education um, institutions where the, there's a, um, the, the, the markers of success and those who they champion as successful are very, very, very at the top, like, level. They don't tend to focus on mid-career people or people that are like operating at different stages. So when you have such a large gap, in a sense, it makes it very difficult for people to see the steps to achieve that level of success. So I think it's about democratizing the kinds of success that you champion and not just always looking at like the really starry, like famous, like <laughs> contemporary um, jewelers that are working either within studio jewelry or our jewelry or, um, or contemporary jewelry, like for example, in Marseille or in these kind of galleries or that are have their own global brands with several kind of outlets around the world. It's great to showcase that to see, you know, what's possible. But I think as well, there needs to be a focus on showing people at different stages of success. Would you go as far to say that there are circumstances where it makes sense to start with Work up. Yeah, I think there could be as well, like, um, you know, there, you could have people looking at what's happening more locally within the community, you could look at different approaches. I mean, I think what it really is, uh, is about empowering people to define their own idea of success. So what is successful for that individual that's in your institution, like, they might not want to have a global brand, their, their idea of success for their jewelry practice might be something very different. And they might not see that reflected to them in the curriculum that's being presented to them. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Yes. I've encouraged everybody to have a look at the uh, jewelry show uh, uh, in the foyer, which we've got on at the moment as well. It's a brilliant jewelry. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Any questions, anything? Should we put it to the rest? Thank you. 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 Thank